Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ellen and I'm an enthusiastic, boundlessly grateful Al-Anon. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's worse in the morning, but this is nap time. I think you could use it. Um, this is so not an Al-Anon conference. <laughs> so alcoholic, and I just love it. I love it. Um, I, I caught myself a couple of times. I had to clean this up up here. It was a mess. I couldn't not do it. I thought about it, and I thought, which will make you crazier? <laughs> It'll make me crazy. I'll be over there. I'll be, that's where I'll be talking to the trash over there. So I just had to clean it up. Um, but there are some other things I didn't have to correct, and I'm very proud of myself. Uh, I read a story the other day about a, um, a, a, a he was a CEO. He was the chief executive officer, officer of this huge company, and he was he was experienced and well-known and good at his job, really good at his job and looked up to. There was only one little tiny flaw. Every time he had to go into the president's office, into his boss's office, he wet his pants. <laughs> and finally, his compassionate boss said to him, you know what, I want you to go to a urologist at the company's expense. And the guy goes, okay, okay. The next week he comes back to the president's office, his pants are wet again. And the, the president said, didn't you go to the urologist? He said, no, but I'm cured. He said, I went to a psychiatrist, and now I'm not embarrassed anymore. <laughs> and that's about our perfect humanness, you know. And it's a tr- it is a trick that alcoholic, particularly alcoholic women know, that Al-Anon women need to learn. So I thank you for yet again being our teacher. Yet again. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, Donna and Paul, Polly and Michael and I were here 10 years ago. So this is a reprise that you've got the four of us back together again. They, they are women who have been strong in my Al-Anon program, all, four, all three of them. And uh, I'm, I was sitting out there, li- uh, you know, listening to Donna is, she just gets better as time goes by. Uh, and Polly and her up here this morning were like, I mean, that was amazing what the two of them did up here this morning. Amazing. And I hear Donna say, I'm so afraid I'm not going to come up with the words. And you heard the words she came up with. They were perfect. They were absolutely perfect this morning. And it was living, now recorded proof that not that we, I really need it, maybe you do, but I don't, that um, <laughs> there really isn't that much difference between us. You think you have cornered the market on those character defects. Oh, no. No, no, no. The the difference is I'm, I may be sicker than you are because I did all that sober. <laughs> I did all that in what, what was as close to the right mind as I could have at the time. And I didn't see anything wrong with it. I thought it was all perfectly, you would too, if you lived the way I lived, you would live like that. And... uh I loved it. I thank you all so much for that. I, all I could think of, of course, is the people at home I want to take it home to because I am an Al-Anon. I'm always thinking of others. Not, that's not always good. But anyway, <laughs> Deb was fabulous. Deb picked me up 10 years ago when I came. She was, she was there then and she was here now. And that's the other thing. Being here with them this weekend, I am struck by the continuity, which is not something we find a lot of. But I'm struck by the fact that those four women are still here, and they're still as enthusiastic, still as willing, maybe more, than they were 10 years ago. And I can't thank you enough for that, for continuing to come back. I know you come back for you. That's what you think. But you come back for me. Um, All right, so enough. Okay. There'll be a lot of conversation. Oh, look, I haven't started my watch yet, so none of that counts. Like I'm going to pay attention to this watch, you know. Uh, Okay. 
Deb, Deb was great. She picked me up yesterday, and we, she even came into the airport after telling me that it was very difficult. Parking was hard, and she, you know, and I said, fine, I can be at the curb, you know. <laughs> I know how to run to the curb and stand there and look pitiful until somebody comes and gets me. And um, so I'm out at the curb, and she, say, she calls me and goes, where are you? <laughs> but I was so fast getting off of that plane and getting out there waiting for Deb. And I missed her. She was going inside waiting for me at the... Uh, we had a lovely lunch. My food was better than hers, but she was better about her food than I was. Um, it was lovely. And I've been to the beach three times. I'm in heaven. Okay, I introduce myself as an al I want to explain it. That's not good news. Explaining things is how I got to al Yeah, I always thought if I could get you to listen long enough, then you'd understand. You know, then I'd find the right words on the right day, and ding, the light would go on, and you'll, oh, the magic words. You're right. (laughs) And then you'd do it my way, and we'd all be happy. Uh, I can still, you know, I find myself sometimes morphing into that. When I I think I need to say one more thing, no, Ellen, you're just explaining. You need to leave the room. You need to not even wait for a response. You just need to leave the room. Um, The deal is God took what looked like a huge character defect and found a use for it, as God can do. You talk about recycle, reuse. That's what God does. No wasted energy here. God said, oh, Ellen, you have worked that explaining muscle up to a fine strength. So I'm going to use it. I'm going to send you around to little nests of people all over the place and let you just explain your heart out. It's your day in the barrel. (laughs) Lucky you. Al-Anon isn't what I wanted to be when I grew up. Never wanted to be Al-Anon. I didn't even know there was Alan on, but if I'd known it, I still want to be that. I think from if you can want to be something before you're born, I think I wanted to be this before I was born. I wanted to be somebody's wife and somebody's mother. And I was going to be the best wife he ever had. And I was going to be the best mother those children ever had. And I'd been in Alan on a couple of years before I realized that I'd never wanted to be me. I never wanted to be the best mother I could be, the best wife I could be. Because I knew somehow it wouldn't be enough. I needed to be the best in your eyes. It's an unattainable goal. And it's very frustrating for everybody involved. (laughs) What I ended up being was somebody's judge and somebody's juror and somebody's executioner. Because I don't just judge you. It's an execution. I take it right to the... (laughs) There's blood in my head. There's blood. When I got to Al-Anon, I didn't want to be here, but I never wanted to be here. I always wanted to be someplace else with somebody else doing something else because I was pretty sure it would always be better there. My first meeting of Al-Anon was November 3rd in 1981. I've been here a long time, and I have there's not been any gaps in that. No, I had, I've had a, I had a three-year gap of no sponsor. We won't go into it, but it was ugly, ugly, ugly. <laughs> Alcoholism, ISM, I sponsor myself. Uh, I've discovered after all these years that there's no there. There's only here. Because even when I get there, I'm just here all over again. And I've brought everything I had right to here. I thought it was going there and somehow I'd lose it in between. But nope, didn't happen. I'd been in Al-Anon a couple of years, and I decided what I really wanted to be was alcoholic. <laughs> a couple of reasons for that. Number one, very obvious that alcoholic women had more fun than we did. <laughs> and number two, apparently my husband preferred them. <laughs> I'm just reporting. So I decided I'd be alcoholic. Now, I wasn't going to drink to be alcoholic. I had some reasons for that. If you're an explainer, it's always good to have backup reasons. <laughs> Number one, I'd, I'm so grateful that Alcoholics Anonymous still believes in open meetings and lets us come, you know, lets us come. I, I, I can't tell, I can't see the disease in the people I love. You know, when, I, when I look at them, what I see is my own pain. What I look is how I hurt. 
But when I can hear an alcoholic I'm not emotionally involved with, it always makes me laugh because there's very few of those. <laughs> I see an alcoholic and I'm in love. Yeah, that's how I know they're alcoholic. I'm in love. When I hear an alcoholic I'm not emotionally involved with talk, I start to be able to see where the difference is between the man and the disease or the woman and the disease. And I can start, I started again in open AA meetings, being willing to love again. Because alcoholism killed that in our house. It killed that. And I didn't want to drink to be alcoholic because I'm from a family of heavy drinkers. I'm from a family that acted as if there was something the matter with people who didn't drink. You should stay away from them. They are fanatics. Some of them might even be Baptists. And see, and I know today they didn't say that, but I have selective hearing, and I tend to hear what it is I think you're going to say, which has nothing to do with what you said. And I had heard about the line. You know, there's some people drink over the line. Some people are apparently born over the line. But um, or the line, I heard one guy say that the line was at the, the mouth of his mother's vagina. <laughs> Boom. Um, you can only say that at a woman's meeting. If you said that at a, <laughs> to a bunch of men, they'd be like, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Did she say that? Yes. She'll say anything. Um, I, in my house, grown-ups had drinks, and I, so I had, when I officially got, when I got married, I'm, I'm now officially a grown-up, is the way, because you could, sure couldn't tell it by the way I acted or the way I felt. So it had to be, okay, I got married, I got a piece of paper, so now I'm a grown-up, and now I'll drink. And I gave myself, because it's in me, two drinks every night. And mostly, or oh, I can't even tell you that anymore, but sometimes I had two and sometimes I didn't. And, but I was afraid after hearing those stories. I enjoyed drinking. It's like I enjoyed smoking. I just enjoyed the whole physical business of it, you know. And how grown up is that to have a drink in one hand and a cigarette in the other, you know, <sighs> burning your children as you go along. Because um, I was not very good with the cigarette. Loved it. Wasn't very good with it. Um, I was afraid because I am run by self-centered fear. You might find that familiar. Uh, that if I let myself, if I let go and let myself drink all I'd have to drink to be alcoholic, I might not get back. There was a good chance I wouldn't get back. And I didn't want to take the chance. Besides, I needed to be alcoholic that afternoon. I really didn't have time. So <laughs> the solution I came up with to that is the same solution I have to any time my diseasiness manifests itself. Donna was talking about that today. There's a difference to me now between diseasiness and uncomfortableness. When I am diseasy, I am not easy. I need you to do a certain thing, be a certain way, say a certain thing, and then I'll be okay. And that eases me. When I'm uncomfortable, it's a very human, spiritual path condition. We are filled with the holy longing, whether we want to be or not. And it makes us not comfortable sometimes. What I know today is when I'm uncomfortable, all I need is comforting. And that's what these rooms are for. That's what your talk of God is for. So I will be comforted. And I walk through the uncomfortableness, uncomfortable, and I don't die. It's not like the diseasiness where I'm so, it really gets to be death defying sometimes. Um, so the solution I come up with when I'm in my diseasiness is I think if I change how it looks on the outside, it's going to change how I feel on the inside. Sometimes I have to change how the person looks. Sometimes I have to change how the, the relationship looks. I'm very good at that. So, and I just have to change it in my head. Nothing changes out here. It's just how I look at it. So really all I needed to do was look alcoholic. Okay, now... I'm going to have to explain this to you because you are Florida alcoholic. And you, some of you, I was thinking when I was coming upstairs, even Florida alcoholic women have a look to them. Uh, you can carry it off, boy, I'm telling you. I came, my first meeting was in North, in North Dallas. And there's a look to alcoholic women in North Dallas. So I had to go out and borrow the clothes. I don't own those kind of clothes. 
But I came out that afternoon in my best alcoholic disguise, in skin-tight jeans and stiletto heels. And I was hot. I made a couple of discoveries in that little experiment. I don't like anything that controls me like those pants did. And um, number two, Al-Anons are doomed to sensible shoes. We really are built for speed and not for looks. If you love an alcoholic, you have got to be ready to go in a heartbeat. Or you could lose him. Maybe injure yourself, but lose him. The place I chose to do that little experiment was at the Crested Butte Mountain Conference in Crested Butte, Colorado. And Polly's been there and Donna's been there with 600 of my closest friends. And there were, now this is the, you know, like 1983 or 84. And there were there that week four people who had between them 125 years of Al Anon, which was a lot of Al Anon in the early 80s. Elsa was there. Marcy was there. Barbara Davis was there. And uh, Nancy Grennan, who's the only one still alive out of that batch. Um, and she has a different last name, so it doesn't matter. Um, I not only got to hear their stories, I got to go to meetings with them. Most important, I got to watch their interactions with their families. And I finally knew what it was I wanted to be when I grew up. I want to be free. I want to be free to be who it is God would have me be. I want that freedom that's offered in step three. The freedom from the bondage of me. That's what I wanted to be. And I came away from that conference so grateful there was such a thing as Al-Anon. And somehow, some way, I had stumbled in here. Now, okay, let's see where it goes from here. This is always exciting. Donna's worried about a word. I don't know, whole, whole phases of my life. You may think, how'd you get to be that old? I don't remember that part of the story. <laughs> you never know. Um, when I got to Al-Anon, I didn't have very many opinions. I either had yours or the opposite of yours depending on what I wanted you to do. Today, I have very strong opinions. That's neither good nor bad. It's just different. And that's what I'm offered in Al-Anon is at least a different way of living. I have very strong opinions about people being called Al-Anon. If you want to watch the hair on my neck stand up, let me be in the room when some new drunk comes in and somebody says, oh, look, there's John, the new drunk. And there's Betty, his little Al-Anon wife, twitching in behind him. Because we do tend to get here with a twitch. <laughs> the only reason they're calling her Al Anon is because she's twitching in behind him. She is not an Al Anon, she's an alligator. <laughs> you know them, you see them in the world all the time, little snappy people. <laughs> Al Anon is not a program for people who need it. The statistics, ever so important for explainers, statistics. The statistics are for every alcoholic, there are one to five people profoundly affected. There are 10 to 42 people directly affected. Al-Anon ought to be 10 times bigger than AA. And it's not a happening thing. It's really hard to come and ask for help when you don't think there's anything the matter with you. <laughs> See, that's how I know you're all alcoholics. The Al-Anons would be falling out of their chairs. Because that's the way we get here, is thinking there's nothing the matter with us. That's why we're so tiny. You've got to stick around here before it finally... See, the Allen on death knell is, it's not that bad. And when we get to it's not that bad, that's good enough. That's good enough. That's what we're used to. That's what's familiar. That's the best it's ever been. So if, you, if we stick around long enough, you know, the... the Okay, so I'll explain this to you. I'm sorry, you just obviously... Um, for reasons that I obviously can't go into because they would take so very long, but believe me, I have them. The um, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is not conference-approved literature for Al Anon. Do not get me started. I, however, was sponsored for my early years by uh, Marcy White. Marcy came into Al Anon in 1954, and there wasn't any Al Anon. She came in with her husband in West Texas. And she came to some meetings and fell madly in love with the process and with alcoholic women. And alcoholic women took her under their wings and took her through the steps, which are in, I hate to remind Alanon, 
the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and so that's what we were brought up on, was the big book. That's the way I know to do the steps. That's the way the AA 12 and 12 in the, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I really think we do a disservice to newcomers by not exposing them. Because if you want to know what the disease of alcoholism is like, who better to ask than the people who suffer it? You know, who better? Where is there a better explanation than the big book? There's not. Now, I had to read it about 42 times before I quit turning corners back from my mother and highlighting parts for him. But on about my 43rd time through there, I went, oh, that's me. I'm on those pages. The bottles are but a symptom. The bottles are but a symptom. We have a tradition in Al-Anon that says the only requirement for membership is that there be a problem of alcoholism in a relative or friend. It doesn't say a problem of alcohol. It says a problem of alcoholism. People think they have to know the name of their... See, AA, anybody can get into. But to get into Al-Anon, you got to know somebody. (laughs) We need to start with the premise that we all know somebody. And what their name is really doesn't matter. You know, newcomers will say to me all the time, but my son is an addict and blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, you know what? Just sit in the chair. Sit in the chair. Keep coming back. If it works for you, you had an alcoholic back there someplace. And it doesn't matter because alcoholism gets passed along in families that don't drink. And how crazy making is that when you don't have anything to point to? So, there, now you've got that opinion. There's so many more to come. (laughs) Anyway. Al-Anon's not a program for people who need it. Al-Anon's not a program for people who want it. We have a lot of newcomers in my meetings. A lot of newcomers. Almost every week we have newcomers in our meeting. Parents of, sisters of, fathers of, brothers of, husbands and wives. They don't come looking for recovery. They come looking for relief. They just want to feel better. And you can't blame them. Relief is in the meetings. It's in the literature. But recovery is only in the steps. And if you don't stay and get the steps, nothing changes. Because nothing's changed. Sometimes the laughter draws them in and sometimes the laughter repels them. Because alcoholism isn't funny. It's a deadly disease. It kills the people who have it and it kills the people who love them. Do you know who uses the insurance first in an alcoholic home? The non-alcoholic. We have all sorts of stress-related diseases. They don't write alcoholism on there, but you can bet that's what it's from. If they just look for the twitch, they'd know. (laughs) I hope she never hears this, but it'll be okay if she does. My sponsor is an older, gorgeous lady whom I just absolutely love so much I could cry when I think about her. And she's having some physical issues, and she had to go to the gastro guy, and they did a colonoscopy, blah, 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 blah. So the guy calls her in to tell her about the report from the colonoscopy the other day. (laughs) She was telling me this on the phone, and he said, now let me ask you something. I'll bet that you're the kind of person that kind of likes to control things, right? (laughs) She said, yeah. And he said, and you have a hard time letting go, don't you? She said, Ellen, he could tell all that just looking up my bottle. (laughs) I told the girls, I said, I think we have a new door check for real (laughs) Al-Anon. I'll straighten him right out the door. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) But if you hear people laughing about stuff this weekend you don't think is funny, keep coming back. You can't laugh about stuff that hadn't been healed. But the good news is if it's been healed for one of us, it can be healed for all of us. All of us. Isn't that great news? All of us. Uh, Al-Anon is really only a program for people who are willing to work at it because it requires effort, action, persistence, momentum. Not necessarily consistency because we're not We'd like you to think we're really good at that, but we're really not. Persistence and momentum. It's hard to get going again once you quit. 
But if you just keep going, just whatever the little thing is you're doing, whether it's going to this meeting or whether it's 10 minutes of meditation, whatever it is, the momentum, once you get it started, it's like getting those days of sobriety built up, you know. I, I'm that way about my walking days. I walk every day. Every day. <laughs> my husband my husband is just amazed. I had to have a little surgical procedure not too long ago. I just got up 45 minutes early. You know, I'm out on the track. But I'm getting the walk in. <laughs> I don't want to miss a day. Just so you know. <laughs> Next Saturday, on the 10th of March, it will be, I will have finished seven years of a walk every day. Every day. And you can tell looking at me that you will not losing weight, lose any weight doing that. <laughs> so don't be thinking you will, because you won't. That is not the measure, one more time, of what a good walk is or what exercise. It's not all about the pool, you know. I'm getting so over this, I can't tell you. Anyway, I'm an Al-Anon. I'm not an Al-Anon because of the people in my life. I'm an Al-Anon because I have a 12-step recovery program that I practice like my life depends on it. I'm convinced today of the fatal nature of my disease. I'm an Al-Anon because I have a sponsor, and she knows she's my sponsor. I think sometimes we need a little checklist. I don't know about you, but in my, my program, we need a little checklist. Do you have a sponsor? Yes. Does she know she's your sponsor? Because <laughs> you know how we are. People say, do you have a sponsor? And you're just like, no, no, no. And then finally you ask somebody, will you be my sponsor? Yes. Now I've done it. Now I feel better. You know, the heat's off. Heat's off. This sponsor knows everything there is to know about me and then some. She loves me better than I can tell you. She loves me better than I think I deserve. And uh, I, I called her the other day by accident. It was 10 minutes to 8 in the morning, and my butt called her, you know. And one of those things, and you look at your phone, oh, my God, I'm calling my sponsor. And um, I'm at school, and i got little three-year-olds running around, and I'm, I'm just like, stop it, stop it. Oh, my God. Oh my God. So I'm doing, hang up, hang up, hang up. She, she called me right back. She called me baby sister. She called me right back. She said, baby sister. And I went, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I, don't, I didn't mean to. And she said, how do you know God didn't know that what I needed to hear right that second was the sound of your voice? I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm an al -Anon. I am so grateful. I cannot thank you enough. When I was 17, Mama diagnosed me. Mama diagnosed me as boy crazy. And the place Mama sent me to be safe was Lubbock, Texas, because she thought there weren't any there, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, it turns out that the very first Al-Anon meeting in the entire state of Texas was held in, Al in Lubbock, because it's a dry area. Do you know about dry areas? That's where they tell alcoholics they can't drink. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. We all know nothing makes them drink faster than tell them they can't, you know. So I was in heaven. I was in heaven. I went looking for him, but I was always looking for him. I always had a him, but I was pretty sure he wasn't the best him, because look, he's with me. So I'm looking for the best him. And I'm always on, I got my eyes. So I got to Lubbock, and ooh, it's a whole new field. I'm looking for him. I found him. Now, he was married to somebody else and had two kids and was 60 pounds overweight, but none of that looked insurmountable to me. I personally have never liked the easy ones who go, oh, you're so cute. No! Get away from me! I want those ones you have to fight for. The ones you have to earn. I got a sister over here. Ones you have to make of you. Yes! We got the power! I hear it in here. We got it. Every time I do that, I get like another rush. You know? <sighs> I'll have what she's having. Well, it took me a year. But a year later, we had shed the wife, the two kids, and the 60 pounds, because I am thorough, you know? And I had him, oh, lucky, lucky me. Now... I have to tell you something interesting that I didn't even think about until I came to Alan. He wasn't drinking when I met him. <laughs> I 
I, you know, I'm starting to see a pattern, though, in here. I didn't know to, I didn't, that I would pick someone who wasn't drinking is weird. It's not particularly weird that he started drinking shortly after he met me. Um, we were married six months when he hit me the first time. He was drunk when he hit me. He was drunk every time he hit me. And the reaction I had to that, nobody, I didn't grow up in a family where big people hit each other. So the reaction I had to that wasn't anything anybody taught me. I thought it up all by myself in my fabulous little solution center here between my ears. You know, the problems in my life have not really been the problems in my life. The problems in my life are the solutions I come up with for what I perceive to be the problems in my life. And the best thing I could think to do was double dog dare him to do it again. Looked like a power move at the moment. As it turns out, it didn't take any more insanity on his part to hit me the second time than it did the first. And that's the way we rocked for nine more years. Because I'm a sticker. I will make my bed and I will damn near die in it. Now, I can't tell you when this happened, but I can tell you as a result of a couple of inventories and trips through the steps what happened. Every time he hit me and I believed what he said, which was, if I hadn't done what I did, he wouldn't have to do what he did. If I hadn't done what I, I deserved what he did. Every time he hit me and I got up the next morning and I looked at a black eye or a split lip or a bloody nose and I said to myself, it's not that bad. I'll just stay in the house another day or another day and nobody will know. Every time I did that, a piece of me left and another piece and another piece and another piece until nine years later there was nobody left who could stand up and say, you can't treat me like this. I'm God's precious child. I was just thinking about something Donna said last night. I told that to a, a professional in the field <clears throat> a couple of years ago. And she said, do you hear how flatly you said that? I said, do you know how many times I've said it? Do you know there's nothing left in there? There's nothing left of that. They're just words. I'm just reporting to you one more time. But then this other guy came along. No. Yes. <laughs> And he said, you don't have to live like that, and I love you. Huh? 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 Added the magic words, you know. When I came to Al-Anon, I looked like the most organized, together person on the planet. But that's the way we look in our diseasiness out there. I always tell, back before this little recession, I would tell people, if your business failed, you didn't have any alligators working for you. You just need a couple of good alligators working there. We will come in early and stay late. We will work while we eat our lunch. Hell, we won't even eat lunch. We'll take it home and do it on the weekend. We'll do our job and somebody else's, and they don't even have to ask us. We just don't like the way they're doing it. We're pretty sure we could do it better. <laughs> when I left my last nine-to-five job, it took five people to replace me. <laughs> and I used to think, I don't think they're doing a very good job. <laughs> little judgment. <laughs> When I got to Al-Anon, um, I looked like I was so together. And nothing could have been farther from the truth. You know, the more chaotic you feel, the more control you attempt. And the more chaotic my life was over here, the more I tried to control this over here. <coughs> um, I got to Al-Anon, and this is the way I think a lot of us get here. We either have one of two feelings. We're either angry or we're hurt. If you come in angry, you're going to have to learn to deal with hurt. If you come in hurt, you're going to have to learn to deal with the anger. It's the same feeling. It's just whether I'm blowing it out on you or sucking it in on me. It's either your fault or my fault. I think it's healthier to be angry. When I got here, I, I hadn't been angry in years. I had been rageful. I had pinned my children to the wall with my rage. But they're the only ones who saw that, and they got it all. I came in hurt. Everything hurt. Everything hurt. It was the only feeling I had. I'd be talking about my sponsor to my sponsor about something, and she'd say, how do you feel? And I'd say, it just hurt. So she made me get one of those magnetic things with the faces on it, you know, the one that says, you know, if you're like this, you're surprised, you know, and if you're like this, you're disappointed, and if you're like this, you're shocked or whatever it is. And she made me put it on the refrigerator. So I'm talking to her on the phone. She'd say, how do you feel? I'd say, I don't know. She'd say, go to the refrigerator. So I have to go to the refrigerator, see if I could find a face that looks kind of like how I might could feel. 
but it was hard. I was having a really hard time with that. And then one day I came up with a new feeling. I was so excited, and I knew she would be. So I called her and said, I have a new feeling. She said, great, what is it? I said, fear. Great, she said. That's great. What are you afraid of? Oh, do I need to know? You know, like something specific? I'm just kind of afraid. And uh, she said, no, we find it very helpful if you know exactly what it is you're afraid of. She believed in chasing fears to their root cause, she used to say. And she never, she always believed it was never what it looked like on the surface. There's always something else. All, and probably something else. So she said, all right, well, let's, now this sounds like it should have taken as long as it takes me to tell you, which hopefully won't be more than about a minute or two, but you never know. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, it took days. She said, what are you afraid of? And I said, oh, I know. I said, now, see, I, okay, I said, I know what it is. I'm afraid he's going to leave me. She said, really? Why do you think that? Well, he said he was. He said he's going. She said, oh, when is he going? <laughs> and I said, Friday. He said he's leaving Friday. She said, let me tell you something, hon. The only way to tell whether or not an alcoholic is leaving you is if he's gone. Uh, that was my first lesson and turn off the sound and look at the picture the sound will confuse you the picture is closer to the truth she said okay let's just say he's gone he's left you now what are you afraid of I said oh my god I'm afraid of being by myself oh, can't be by myself that's the worst she said are you sure what happens if you're by yourself now? What are you afraid of? Well, when it went from is, he's going to leave me, I'm going to be by myself, and when I'm by myself, I'm going to discover my worst fear is true, which is I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough, pretty enough, old enough, young enough, wealthy enough, whatever it is. Not enough. I'm not enough. I'm not enough to take care of myself. And if I can't take care of myself, what was under that, I'll die. Now, that's a little kid, very human fear. But I didn't mature either. And I'm still operating off of I'm not enough and I'll die. When somebody said I love you to me, what I heard was I won't leave you. I'll stay with you. So when this guy said, and I love you, <laughs> done with that one, now i got a new one. That's the way I dated too. <laughs> <laughs> done with you, new one. Um, and see, I knew what I'd done wrong the first time. I had this little mental list of what the, the real guy ought to be like. You know, this guy was perfect. I can see him right now. Right height, right age, right job, right education, right family, right income. He was perfect, except for one tiny little flaw. He didn't come home nights. <laughs> but I'm thinking, you know, a couple of home-cooked meals and a little, you know. And I got him. Yeah, you laugh, but you're just like me, you know. Back in the day, that was how I marked my territory, you know. <laughs> then came menopause. <sighs> and now, who cares, you know. <laughs> sort of like Polly. <laughs> I wish you all the luck. Um, I think you young one, just go ahead. It does have a beginning and a middle and an end. You just need to get it while you can and just let it be a happy memory, you know. <laughs> Everything has a beginning and a middle and an end. Everything. Well, anyway. I thought for a while I was doing it right because he came home every night. Because you may have noticed it is all about me. Have you noticed that? All about me. So I'm pretty sure I'm doing it right because he's coming home. Night came, he didn't come home. Well, I'm involved with a, a subset of alcoholic I've never been involved with before. He was a bar-drinking alcoholic. I didn't know anything about that. But I'm sure it's about me. I lay on the floor of the bathroom and I cried because I was pretty sure he saw the two pounds I gained and that's why he didn't love me anymore and that's why I wasn't coming up. And then I thought to myself, oh, stupid, stupid me, what was I thinking? This morning he said, what's for dinner? I said, roast. Everybody knows pork chops are his favorite thing. And, and I made myself a promise that from now on, whenever he said, what's for dinner, I'm always going to say pork chops. <laughs> I can change it as soon as I get him in the door. But I just got to get him in the door. 
And then I decided what I needed to do was go sit on the sofa and wait. Ah, see, if you're in training for al you must pass waiting 101. And the way you know that you're in waiting 101 is if when you are waiting, you can do nothing else. You can't talk on the phone. You can't read a book. You can't wash your clothes. Can't cook a meal. The kids would come up and they'd go, Mom, and I'd go, shh. Because while I'm waiting, I'm listening. And I'm listening for the sound of those tires. There are 44 bazillion other tires on the planet. (laughs) Don't care about them. I know the sound of those tires. And you know what? I have the same reaction to the sound of those tires as I've heard alcoholics say a drink did for them. I would hear those tires and I'd go, ah, it's all going to be okay. Because he's home now. It's all going to be okay. (laughs) My next thought may be, I'm going to kill him in his bed. But at least he would die in his own home. And it was always preferable to be a, a widow than a divorcee, you know. Well, here's the thing. He came home. I've discovered, listening to a number of AA talks, that 99 times out of 100, they come home. It might be that day or next week or three years later, but they come home. And I met him at the door like a three-year-old who's been crying all afternoon, and you've said, stop it. You know, I was at that (laughs) place, you know, with the big swollen eyes and the snot slinging everywhere. I think to myself, you know, he must be thinking to himself, if that's what's waiting for me, I'll just have another. <laughs> and I asked the second stupidest question you can ask. The stupidest, of course, is, have you been drinking? <laughs> second stupidest is, where have you been? <laughs> because, and let me tell you the reason I asked that question. I'm pretty sure you do this, but I'm really glad we got the doors closed back then. I, hate, I don't like telling this story in, in earth places when the doors are open. I'm not kidding. I was way up at the front of some room and there's all these people and it's dark and then I can see the people walking by, the regular hotel people walking by back there and I, I was telling this part of the story and I watched this guy I looked back. <laughs> <laughs> I could almost see him going, 911, 911. <laughs> Crazy person. <laughs> but you will understand. When I don't understand what's going on or I don't like it, I make up stories in my head and I live in my head. And my stories never have a happy ending. My stories are always, there's blood. And it's it's bad. And I'm always, you know, the worst injured in the whole thing. And uh, I didn't know what was happening, and my head made up a story. And the story my head made up was that he was driving his car out in the country. I don't know why. He was just out in the country. And then for some reason, I don't know why, his car just blew up all by itself. I don't know why. And it blew his body into this ditch by the side of the road. And the people are driving by, but they can't see him because he's down in the ditch. And he's dying. And he's not quite dead yet. And with his dying breath, he's calling me. And he's saying, Ellen, (coughs) Ellen, I love you. Now wild animals are coming and tearing off body parts and strewing them in the forest. It'll be seven years before we can identify the body. But I came here, I came here calling that love. I thought I could worry about things enough to control them, you know. They said, honey, that's not love, that's obsession. And you can tell it's obsession if you can take it all the way in your head till somebody dies. That's obsession. Obsession is all out warfare and powerlessness. The more powerless I feel, the more obsessed I get. I might get obsessed about the thing I'm powerless over, and I might pick out something else altogether because I'm an equal opportunity obsessor. I can do it with my weight or yours, (laughs) especially if you're married to me. I can do it with my children or yours. I can do it with money. I can do it with just about anything. It's that magic, magnifying mind. Let me look at that a little closer. I'm pretty sure it's worse than you think. (laughs) Today I know I'm not so afraid of that squirrel cage thinking when it starts because I know today that it's a sign. It's a sign there's a place in my life that I'm powerless and I've either been unwilling or unable to address it. But that's the sign. And I have a process. I have a a program of recovery that will allow me to start at one. That's zero for me. That's step zero. You know, that's that part in the big book that talks about I could go to the bitter end, blotting out, or I could accept spiritual help. That's such a tricky little word, that accept. 
because I ask, but I don't accept. The help comes, and I go, oh, no, but not like that. <laughs> I was hoping for something in red, you know, <laughs> on Tuesday. I don't know. With pork chops, please. Uh, so I'm asking him where he's been because that's what's in my head. The only acceptable answer was going to be in a ditch bleeding. That's the only acceptable answer. Anything else he said was going to hurt me. And he said, Jesus, you knew where I was. Well, the truth is I knew where he went. He only went three places. He was at home, at work, or in the trap room drinking. But I have the ability to hold opposing thoughts and they never touch. And the two thoughts were, number one, he loves me more than anything in the world. And remember, my life depended on that that he loved me more than anything. And the other one was, he's in the trap room drinking. And in my diseasiness, I would rather wish him dead than know the truth. And he said, you have certainly worked yourself up into a state. I don't know why I stay married to you. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Now, what's the matter with this picture? He's three hours late and drunk. And I'm the one saying I'm sorry. I have an addiction to mind-altering men. Actually, it's not limited to men, I've discovered. Anyone can mess with my mind, and you don't even have to be present to win. I can do it without you and blame it on you. It's perfect. It's the perfect thing. Well, we'd been married a little while, and... uh, you're thinking, is she ever going to get to Al-Anon? Yes. You can tell she got there eventually. Um, a, a, a parent at the school where I worked called one day crying. And, boy, if you want to watch the alarms go off for an alligator, put us in the room with somebody crying. Because, you know, there's, my Al-Anon group must have seven or eight boxes of Kleenexes around the table. People cry in just about every Al-Anon meeting on the planet. People cry because they hurt. People cry because they're safe. Um, People, I think sometimes we have tear debts. There were so many times we should have cried and we couldn't cry or we wouldn't cry. And our body remembers that we need to cry. So sometimes people are crying. They go, I don't know why I'm crying. We go, it's okay. Just cry all you need to. (laughs) But the deal in my Aladon group is we don't slam the Kleenex at them. It's a very subtle way of saying, I bet those tears are bothering you because they're bothering me. Dry them up. Let him, let him make the first reach for the Kleenex. <clears throat> let him reach out. Let him take an action. And if they want to sling snot all over the table, it won't be the first layer of snot on the table. <laughs> let him cry. And when people hurt in our meetings, we don't put our arms around them and tell them everything's going to be okay. Because I can't tell you that everything's going to be okay. There's so many times today when it sucks. It just sucks. Life is not for sissies. It's not. But we can tell them that whatever they're going through, there's somebody in the room who's been through it too. And whatever it is, if they will open up and let us know what's happening, they won't have to do it by themselves. The big book says I'm supposed to share with you what I used to be like and what happened and what I'm like today, not what it was like. (laughs) Because it sucked then and there are plenty of days today when it sucks again, you know. So... um, She's, she's crying on the phone, and I'm an alligator, and oh my God, she's obviously uncomfortable, and the primary alligator illusion is when you're okay, then I'll be okay. And I have to do everything in my power to make you okay. I will lie, I will cheat, I will steal. I will go places with people I don't want to be with, doing things I want to, don't want to do. But I do it so I can get a reaction back from you that's going to make me okay. And if I don't get that reaction back from you, I will try harder. I will serve pork chops every day. I used to take my clothes off. I don't do that anymore kind of afraid of an opposite reaction. <laughs> and I said, oh my, she said, my husband is in a 12-step recovery program for alcoholism and as part of his recovery, we're going to pay the school all the money we owe him. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, oh, I understand. My husband drinks too, too much too. Now I had never said those words. And it really wasn't even the truth. There was no such thing as not drinking, as drinking too much. I knew that in my family. Nobody ever drank too much. They just were heavy drinkers. And uh, at least that's what they told me, she said with a twitch. (laughs) Um, 
But the problem was that he didn't come home nights. But see, I'm pretty sure that's about me. If I was a better wife, if the house was cleaner, if I moved the TV three inches over this way, if I, the kids were quieter, if I, if I cooked pork chops, something I could do to make him come home every night. Now, I wasn't going to tell her that, but I could say he drank too much just because I thought that might make her feel better. I didn't know I was talking to somebody new in Al-Anon. We're deadly when we're new. We don't really know what the questions are, but we got a lot of answers. And we just sort of throw the answers out at you, you know. But she was perfect for me because as much as she didn't know, I knew even less. And she took me to meetings. Took It took about six months. I've never fought against anything as hard in my life as I fought against going to that first Al-Anon meeting. And the only reason I went was because I had gotten to the place in my life where all I could do was cry. You talk about depression. All I could do was cry. Deciding what shoes to put on in the morning was a major decision. I'd sit on the edge of my bed and cry over the shoes. My daughter would have to come in some mornings and help me get dressed. If I got to school with shoes that matched, it was not uncommon for people to go, oh, Melissa dressed you today. <laughs> yeah, now I know. Um, and I ended up in a, in a psychologist's office, and he said, he knew me, he knew my family, and he said, I don't have your answers, and the only people who might have them are al She called again the next day to see how it was going. And I felt like I was coming out of the jungle with my arms up, surrendering to the enemy, admitting that there was this huge thing that I always thought I ought to be able to do and I couldn't do it. I thought maybe they would have some some tips, a few little words to help me. And all I did was fall in with the island of broken toys, you know. It was a whole room full of people who went, ha, we've got no power, yeah! I'm like, What? I thought maybe, you know, we were all partial personalities, and maybe we could all band together as one real person and go around and fix them all, one at a time. <laughs> Whatever. You know, it's like I worked the steps the first time to prove to you why they wouldn't work for me. They worked for you, but they weren't going to work for me. Turns out steps don't care why you work them. They don't care. So I landed in a nest of winners. And I, it's difficult because winners don't always have name tags on. They do this weekend, which is one reason I love these things. You obviously are willing to go for more than just the first miracle. You obviously want more. And believe me, there's so much more. And, you know, it seems like this thing that I keep shooting for is ever receding, ever receding. It seems like I think I should be there by now. Oh, no, you're just here, still here. A sponsee of mine told me the other day, she said, the evidence of grace is the distance I travel that doesn't equal the footsteps I took. A sponsee, for God's sake. (sighs) Pretty sure she read it somewhere. (laughs) Maybe not. (laughs) She does have a pretty good teacher. Anyway. Oh, we got to get on. There's so much more I have to tell you. So anyway, I, I landed in a nest of winners, and, and I thought the first step was get in the car. They'd say, so-and-so is doing the steps across town. We're going to go on Thursday night. We'll pick you up at 730. They didn't say, do you want to? Can you get a babysitter? Can you work it into your busy schedule? We're coming by to get you get in the car. And I'm, my people-pleasing saved my life. I didn't want to disappoint them. Yeah, I'll get in the car. Okay. Abandon my children one more time, but that, you know, there was a payoff for that. However, I'm alive to make amends to them, which, you know, the other way around wouldn't have happened. Well, anyway, <clears throat> so I'm hanging out with them and I'm in love. I'm in love. I'm in love. I'm in love with this program. I'm in love with the people. I'm in love with the energy that I have found in these rooms, particularly in the open AA meetings, particularly in those meetings. And um, in 1984, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was 38 years old, too young, no history of it in my family. Uh, I've been in Al-Anon about two and a half years. Otherwise, I'd be dead today, and you'd have another speaker. But I had two and a half years of Al-Anon under my belt by then. Um, They gave me a 60-40 chance of living another five years. It was in my limbs. And... uh, I have hung my life on a couple of lines out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Number one of them is in Dr. Paul's story when he says, nothing but nothing happens by mistake in God's world. What wonderful assurance. I believe it with all of my heart and soul. The God that I have come to not understand 
can use everything, even what looks like the biggest problem in the whole world, the biggest mess in all the world. God can use it. As a matter of fact, God kind of likes that stuff, I think. It's show-off time for God when he gets there. (laughs) Sometimes I think God's alcoholic, don't you? Just a little hint of that. Um, I say if you have to give up a body part, go for boob. Nothing, nothing you did with two, you can't do with one. <laughs> Pretty much all they're good for is holding up clothes. And uh, you could do it with Kleenex if you need to. Um, hair was hard. That was hard. That was hard. Uh, it was a tough year. The other part of the big book is the fourth column of that inventory that basically says, and what was your part? Actually, I believe the word it uses is mistake. I don't like that word. I go for part. If I had to look for mistakes, I'd never find them. But if I can look for part, I stand a much better chance of finding it. What was your part? Which was the first time in my whole life I understood that there are not some places in my life where I'm a helpless victim and other places where I have a part. I have a part in every bit of it. Even if my part is nothing more than carrying the resentment down the years, that's my part. I wanted to know what my part was in the cancer. I didn't know any other way to take proactive steps to save my own life. So I did the steps. I came out of a step study. The, some of my Al-Anon women banded together, and they said, we're going to have a closed step study, and we're going we're to work the steps with you, not for you, with you. Work their own steps at their energy. And I came out of that step study recognizing that somewhere in my head I had said to myself, if I can't have him, I'll die. And my body doesn't take those nuances. You know, it's very literal. And my body went, got it. We can make that happen. There were studies then that said that st- cancer is a stress-related disease. I don't know anything more stressful than living in active alcoholism, at least not for me. For the umpty umpth time I said it, for the first time I meant it. If you cannot stay sober, you cannot stay here. One more time, my life is on the line. You had treated me like my life was valuable. I love that thing in step two that says restore. It doesn't say beat back into shape or make look like something else. It's restore. I was being restored. And I, for the first time, my life was valuable to me. And he moved out. If you ask him why he moved out, it wasn't his drinking, of course. It was my daughter's behavior. That anyone would drink who had to live with that little wench. Well, it was kind of hard. But she was crazy. I knew she was crazy. She came home one Saturday morning, should have been home Friday night, didn't come home. You see the pattern in my life? I get people who don't come home. If God had sent alcoholics who sat in their chair and drank till they passed out, I'd be dead and you'd have another speaker. But I got alcoholics who didn't come home. Now, she started not coming home. That one time, I'd been in Al-Anon long enough to hear that bad news is perfectly capable of making the entire journey to you. You do not have to hunt it down. So I didn't have to call the hospitals or the sheriff or any of that stuff. This is long before cell phones. I did what it teaches in the ODAT, which is get a good night's sleep so maybe you'll be prepared for whatever it is you have to handle the next day. You can see her now walking in the back door, and it's middle of the morning on Saturday morning, and she said, Mama, it was terrible. We were driving last night, minding our own business, and this car came from nowhere. Really, Mom, we don't know who they were. They tried to run it off the road. Oh, it was so scary, Mom. The police came, and the police said it wasn't our fault or anything. And, you know, of course, by now I'm in the, and, you know, because bring me all your extra feelings. Just let me have them over here. And she's piling them on, as only she can do. And I said, is everybody okay? She said, yeah, we're, we're okay. I'm kind of tired. I think I'll go to my room. <laughs> and I'm in the living room, you know, with a, ah, 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 you know. So they called from school a couple, of, a couple of years later, and they said, there's something the matter with your daughter. Duh. And they said, we're going to take her for an evaluation. Really? Two days later, they called from the treatment center, and they said, oh, Ms. Davis, hate to tell you this, but we do believe your daughter's alcoholic. And I said, and they said, huh, we've not had a lot of mothers react like that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yay, she's alcoholic. I thought she was crazy. That's an al disease. No sign she'll ever get help for that, you know. But alcoholic, yes, 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 yes. And she's 17. I could make her do stuff, you know. 
Poor, I, you know, I'm frustrated. I've had a couple of alcoholics I couldn't do anything with. This one I can fix. <laughs> or at least turn her over to the people I think can fix her. So I took her to a place that would force feed the steps in her. Oh, I'm so grateful you all, particularly you all. Do what you do for the reason you do it and not for some kind of success rate, you know. Statistics are that 80% of the young people who come in have to go back out because they're not done. She came in and she got sober and she stayed sober about a year and a half and then she headed back out. It was a lot worse the second time than it was the first time. Um, She came back into Alcoholics Anonymous on January 29th of 1990. I had nothing to do with it and you had everything to do with it. You didn't treat her like she was too young to be alcoholic. You didn't treat her that, like she hadn't suffered long enough. Apparently any amount of suffering will do. You didn't treat her like she did drugs, and somehow that negated her alcoholism. My daughter got sober twice before it was ever legal for her to get buy a drink. The best thing I ever did was get a program, get a life, and get out of her way and let her do what she needed to do. She just celebrated 22 years of sobriety. <clears throat> she is still really, really, really alcoholic, just in case you wonder. Really alcoholic. Um, in that little time she was sober, she got pregnant. No. Yes. And um, it, was, yeah, it, was, it was really fun. She, uh, the way she announced it to me was, you're going to be a grandmother. <laughs> like, uh, now it's my responsibility, you know. <laughs> And that's the way I took it. She swears to this day she just thought that was a cute way to tell me. But I, I can see the whole load, you know. She might be carrying them, but I'm feeling the weight, you know. And when that when the babies were born, they were premature, and I'd fallen in love in the heartbeat in the hospital with heartbeats. And that's what Al-Anons do. If you've never been loved by an Al-Anon, you don't know what you're missing. We love you from somewhere above your feet, above your head to somewhere below your feet. And I fell in love with heartbeats. And I... I was in love with them before they ever breathed air, you know. Um, when they were five weeks old, Melissa said, Mom, I'm not going to keep them and you can have them. And uh, I did a lot of praying. I did a lot of talking. My sponsees left. They left. Um, the woman I used as a sponsor at the moment left. She said I was messing with people's reality because one day I was keeping them and the next day I was giving them up. But that's how I felt. One day I'm keeping him, the next day I can't. Um, my sponsor's sponsor, whom I ended up having to go to, thank you, God, um, she had been telling me for years that God wants for me what I want for me in my heart of hearts, but I'm so terrified I'll pick the wrong thing. What if I pick this and next week something better comes and I'm stuck because I have picked that? It has happened to me more times than I can tell you. So I just don't pick anything. I let alcoholics pick it and then get mad at them because they picked the bad thing. Um, she said, honey, you're going about this all wrong. The deal is you walk in the direction of your dreams. God's deal is that or something better. God isn't a terrorist waiting around the corner to test your patience. God really, really, really wants you happy, joyous, and free. Walk in the direction of your dreams. Well, I knew what that was. I didn't want to be their mom. They're the children of two addicts, and I didn't like the odds. But I sure wanted to be their grandma. So I went to adoption agencies, and I said, I'm looking for a family that wants two babies and a grandmother. (laughs) If you don't ask, you aren't going to get it. (laughs) Took We thought it would take weeks. We thought it would take days. It took months. They were almost five months old when we found the family. Didn't care that there were two babies. Didn't care that one of them had some physical issues. Didn't care that the family wanted to stay involved. They said, if it's God's will. And when Melissa heard that, she said, I picked them. I said, I picked them. They let me pick the surrender date, and that's what they called it, was surrender date. Oh, I have never had a more painful day in my whole life than handing those boys over and knowing I might never see them again. This family said we could stay involved, but once I handed them over, it was totally up to them. They let me pick the date, and the date I picked was the day I was leaving for Crested Butte to be with 600 of my closest friends because I needed intensive care that week. I swear to you I could hear the babies crying in Colorado from Texas. I swear to you I woke up hearing them crying. Well, my baby boys are going to be 24 in just a week. 
On the 15th of March, they will be 24. Wow. Has it been a trip? Or what? <laughs> they um, had a little stutter start at the beginning, but after that, until they were um, about uh, juniors in high school, there wasn't a month that went by that I didn't have a meal with them. Their parents made sure that happened. I stayed their grandma forever and ever, but they're boys. They were 10 before they realized that their mom was older than their grandma. And whose mother was I, anyway? <laughs> they were just, I mean, they're just clueless, you know. <laughs> There's no point in telling them any sooner because they weren't going to, you know, it wasn't going to go through. <sighs> I'm their grandma. And they didn't have a particularly easy bringing up. It's not a bringing up I would have picked for them, but it was the way it was. Their parents don't believe in alcoholism. So thank you, John. So um, the boys, and I talked to this one, Anthony. We talked to him. He didn't realize that he knew Melissa, and Melissa could see him any time she wanted. She just didn't want to as much as I did. Um, he didn't realize until he was 19 years old that she was, had been drinking, started in the eighth grade. He didn't realize. He had no idea. She, no one ever talked to him about that. He didn't know. He said, gosh, Grandma, he said, I didn't have my first beer until graduation night. Melissa wanted him in this little town 75 miles north of us, so maybe they wouldn't be exposed to life in the big city. So they grew up 75 miles north of us. He didn't have his first beer until graduation night. Two years later, he has five alcohol-related citations. Two of them are from the Segway cops, walking drunk. <laughs> so embarrassing. Well, but one of them, one of them, he uh, decided to outrun the cops. And they clocked him at 138 miles an hour going through his little town, and as God would have it, he ran out of gas. Thank you, God. Let's think of how happy the cops were when they caught him. Not. Um, he was a convicted felon by the time he was 22, did nine months in prison. Last report, my, my friends. He was in Miami. <laughs> My darling boy, he, I see him. I don't see him as often as I wish I did, but I see him pretty often. He, he calls me fairly regularly. And he went, came out to visit a friend in Florida a couple of weeks ago. And when he came back, I said, so how was it? He said, me, Florida is a place for guys like me. That's where I need to be. And I started to tell him, if you look closely at the state line, there's a sign that says it's not here. <laughs> and he's pretty sure it's here. If you see this breathtakingly handsome young man with a really not very nice scar on his face, that's my boy. That's my boy. Um, <clears throat> well, John said we have to stop. John, no fun. Um, <laughs> John's nice. Uh, so let me tell you the rest of this really quick. I'm going to tell you this part. When the kids left, I did an inventory on... Um, relationships and I discovered since I've been 12 I've either been chasing after going with waiting for engaged to married to divorced from engaged to married to divorced from somebody but there's always been somebody I have this great big hole beside me and I throw lots of people in this hole to try to fill me up I'd like to tell you how special they are I don't remember most of their names <laughs> <coughs> and I and I decided that if I was ever going to find out who I was I was going to have to let the hole be empty and let God fill the hole. So if you're not going to hang out with boys, it only leaves you one other choice. Girls. You're not number one with me. Sorry. I'm, I'm just not. I just uh, Girls want to do things like, let's go shopping. <laughs> Shoot me. Um, that whole thing just sounds dreadful. Torture. I mean, that's torture. Um, but I got nobody left to hang with now but the girls. So I'd call the girls up and I'd say, I'm going to the conference this weekend. Uh, you can ride with me if you want to. i got plenty of room for seven pairs of shoes, if that's what it takes you for the conference. I can do the whole thing in my flip-flops. But if you need ten pairs of shoes, bring them on. And every time you have to pee, we'll stop the car. I've never seen anything like girls and peeing. I swear. I think I could make it from Texas to Kansas if I had to. But if you ride in the car with girly girls, one of them will go, oh, look, there's a bathroom. Do I have to? Yes, I do. Pull in, pull in, pull in, pull in. You know, a minute ago, minute ago, no problem. Now it's an emergency. But the biggest concession I made was, okay, every time we pass a Walmart, we'll go in. I mean, Walmart just killed me dead. There was way too much stuff. I have, and you may not be able to tell this, but I have such ADD. You know, I'm like, squirrel. <laughs> um, it just overwhelmed me. 
I believe now there should be red neon crosses in the front of Walmart because healing happened to me in the aisles of Walmart. I was healed at the Walmart in Dallas, in Dalhart, Texas, where everything smells like slaughtered calf. We were on aisle 12, and they had $5 bathing suits. We got to laughing about those $5 bathing suits. I couldn't believe you'd put it on and actually get it wet. I thought it would dissolve like communion wafer, you know, if you stuck it under your tongue, you know. It would just... We laughed so hard. I thought they were going to call for cleanup on aisle 12, you know. A wonderful thing happened to me in the time I hung out with the girls. I discovered that I'm enough for me. Nobody has to be added to make me okay. I'm enough. I'm enough. There are lots of times I need help, and I'm not afraid to ask. And 99 times out of 100, I'm going to ask another woman. God speaks to me in the language I understand best, and that's you. Um, I, have a, I have a precious husband. I, sorry, hon, don't have time to talk about you. <laughs> He also was an alcoholic when I married him. Now he's got 17 years of continuous sobriety. <laughs> Just reporting. <clears throat> the day he stood up and took a chip, my friend was behind me. She, everybody knows him, of course. He's been hanging out with me for years. And my friend behind me slamming me on the shoulder. Slamming. She goes, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And all of a sudden she grabs me and she goes, you're a carrier. <laughs> Didn't cause it, can't control it, can't cure it. Okay. I used to think that when I died and went to heaven, God was going to say, pull out the VCR and the tape, and I want to know how her husband and her children turned out. And if they turned out to be fine, upstanding members of the community, she's earned her way into heaven, and she can go in. I am so grateful. You've let me hunt another God. I don't know what's going to happen when I leave here, but it's a story my, my sponsor says I can keep. I think when my body gets tired of doing whatever it is we're doing here, and that little part of me that's always been God's goes to where God is which could be over there. When I get there, God's going to go, Oh, Alan, there you are. You know heaven's heaven when you're not here, but it's just not perfect without you. (laughs) And he's going to say, You know what? I've been running a little experiment down there. It's not a test. It was nothing you could pass or fail. It was just a little experiment. And I know you've been paying close attention, so I'd like your opinion. (laughs) Maybe in your heaven, God will want your opinion. In my heaven, he won't smile. First question, did you have a good time? There was no reason for flowers to be different colors. And I was thinking last night, I was picking up shells on the beach for the nine little kids in my class at school, and I picked up nine little shells, and I thought there's no reason for shells to be different colors. Except God thought it would make us smile, and God thought it would make us happy. And he's going to say, I'm going to be able to say just like you did, oh, yes, God, I had a great time at the party. Thanks for asking. And God's going to say, were you Ellen? You were the only one like that I made. I had things for you to do that nobody else could do. My hands are too big. My voice is too loud. And that scared me. I've spent so much of my life trying to be what I thought other people wanted me to be. That I didn't know if I'd been me. So in my little written inventory at night, I added a line that said, today, Ellen. And I wrote down every day what I thought was mine to do that day. This was mine to do today. You could have had another speaker and been done, oh, 15, 20 minutes ago, but that's not what happened to us. (laughs) This is what happened to us. 99% of those things I wrote down were what you would call service work. And the last thing he's going to say is, Precious, did you ever get the joke? I got the joke the year of cancer, standing at the back door with no hair on my body. Girls got the picture. No hair. Except for the gray. What a joke, God. Which kind of flew around like fried nerve endings. I didn't have nearly this much of it. And I got ready to go out and look down and realize I'd lost all the hair on my body. Except under my arms and on my legs. And I was going to have to go back in and shave my legs. I started laughing. And I could hear God laughing. I could hear God rolling around the floor of heaven. He'd gone to a lot of trouble to set that up. And what I... What I understood was, right that second, I was just fine. Right that second, I I had everything I needed for that second. I've spent so much of my life focused on what I'm not going to get that I think I have to have to be okay, or focused on what I'm afraid I'm going to lose that I think I have to have to be okay, that I've missed the miracle of right now, when every now I've gotten to has had everything I need. Every now. 
There's a guy in our group that says a glass isn't half full or half empty. The glass is just too damn big. Bill Cosby says the glass is either half full or half empty, depending on whether you're drinking or pouring. (laughs) The miracle of what we do here is somehow when I stand up here and pour, when I sit down, I'm the one whose cup overflows. And I thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.